supposed to speak from the Word this morning. Um, we're running a little late on time, and my consolation is that we are giving you food, so you guys should be content. So, and it's actually really nice food. Again, trusted my wife, and it's very, very good. So, 1 Samuel 4 is where we're going to be this morning. For several weeks, I've been pondering on, God, what do you want me to say this morning as we celebrate five years, as we look back and as we look forward? And so many different thoughts came to my mind. And in the midst of that, I was reminded of the first sermon I did here, March 13, 2011. And went to my computer, opened it up, and started reading through it and just reading through the sermon. I was like, you know... Those words that I said five years ago on the stage for our first service is just as relevant today. And so if you were here five years ago, and if your memory is incredibly sharp, I'm sorry. But um, for the rest of you guys, 1 Samuel 4. And what I want to do is look and talk about three different stones in the life of Israel. This morning we're going to talk about Ebenezer. Ebenezer is a word that means a stone of help. And that's where our focus is going to be today, a stone of hope. No doubt today is a great day of celebration for us as a church. We enjoy a great experience of blessing as we celebrate five years together. The road here to this morning wasn't easy. And there were many times we wondered if we'd make it. I remember one time, probably about three, four years ago, we sat and we wondered, should we merge with another church and maybe... God was just calling us to start and, um, and get rolling, and maybe someone else was supposed to lead it. And so grateful that God shut those doors and that we can be able to celebrate today. Um, God has been incredibly faithful. But I want to make sure you understand what we're doing here. It would be wrong for us not to stop and reflect, not to pause and celebrate, and surely not to articulate what we are doing here and what God has intended for us. God has immensely blessed Lost City Church during these past five years, and he has brought so many of us together to touch many lives during this time span. And the question I want to ponder this morning is, what is our proper response to God's faithfulness and blessings to us? What is our proper response to God's faithfulness and blessings to us? And in 1 Samuel chapter Four, all the way through chapter 7, we're going to look at three stones that the children of Israel, God's people, come to, and that these, what these three stones will teach us about how we are to rightly respond to God. The first two stones will show us wrong ways to respond, and the third stone is the right way to respond in a heart of worship and gratitude toward God. 1 Samuel 4, 1 through 4 is where I'm going to be. The word of the Lord came to Samuel and all of Israel, through Samuel to all of Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came back to camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people went to Shiloh, and they brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who was enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. The first stone that we see in our study this morning is this. It's actually called Ebenezer. But it's ironic because this Ebenezer is not what we desire to be as a church. The first stone and what it teaches us, what I want to present to you this morning in the lesson is this. The first stone teaches us this, doing something great for God. Doing something great for God. That sounds nice, right? It sounds amazing. We want to do great things for God. But what I believe this stone will teach us, that there is... Nothing wrong with doing great things for God. But the question is whether or not God is leading us to do those great things. The Israelites went to battle against the Philistines. They were greatly defeated. 
4,000 of their men were killed in battle in one day. And so they said, obviously something is wrong here. What are we supposed to do? And they said, let's go bring the Ark of the Covenant into the battlefield with us. And now we have the presence of God with us. We're going to win the battle. And so the Ark of the Covenant, which is this box, it's a rectangular box about um, 45 inches long, 27 inches deep, and 27 inches down. And it it was a box that held the promises of God to the people of Israel. In the ark was the Ten Commandments, God's writings of his laws to the people of Israel. In the ark was a pot of manna, which represented God's provision to the people when they wandered in the wilderness. In the ark was Aaron's rod, which represented God's power and his um, tremendous power to them as they went from battle to battle, journey to journey. The ark was the symbol of God's presence among his people. And when the ark was brought out from Shiloh, the people rejoiced incredibly. They shouted and screamed so loud that the Philistines heard it. And they even made a comment, you'll see as you continue to read down, that there's a God among the people of Israel. And they were nervous, they were scared, and they were worried about what to do. And all of a sudden, one of them manned up and said, let's just go fight the battle. And so the next day, the Philistines went and fought the Israelites. The Israelites had the Ark of the Covenant with them, and the Philistines won the battle again. And in the midst of the battle, the Israelites flee, and they leave the Ark of the Covenant behind. The Philistines take it, and now it's held hostage by the Philistines. Stone number one teaches us that without God, we are absolutely powerless. Without God, we cannot do anything. There is no great work that we can do for God without God. Religion and self-righteousness builds false hope that there may be some type of substance to our words or to our action, but there is no difference that is made. There is no impact that's made. Great work for God that is entertained or engaged in without God's leading is useless for the kingdom of God. What's your point? Here's my point. Doing something great for God that God has neither commanded, asked, or led us to will bear no fruit for the kingdom of God. Lost City, let me remind you again, like I did five years ago, that we are to never engage in those things that God does not lead us into. There are many, many good things that we can get involved in. There are many good things that we can put our hands into. These are worthy causes. But if we are not careful, these good things can take us away from the mission that God has called us to do. Bluff City, we must, be, we must remain committed to the gospel of Jesus. To preaching it, to sharing it, to serving it, to loving others into it, to loving each others with it. We must be committed to the gospel always. And it begins here in our church, extends into our city, and the scripture says it goes all the way to the ends of the earth. If we do everything else well and we fail at this, we failed miserably. If we have engage in so many other things, but we do not preach the gospel and live out the gospel, we fail. If we get captured in everything else, but we forget the gospel, we fail. The closest physical representation of God that we have in this world is is his book, the Bible. But if we worship what we are, but if we worship the book without worshiping the one who is in this book, we fail. The people of God, we are the living presence of God in this world, and His Spirit abides in us. But if we worship who we are as a church more than whose we are, then we fail. We've lost track. We don't have the power to change lives. There are no arrangements or impassioned pleas of words that I can make on a weekly basis that can change the hearts of a person, but the simple spoken word of God, unadorned, unadulterated, broken, spoken in broken language through broken people, that holds the power to change 
lives. It's changed mine. It's changed yours. That's why we're here. May we never lose sight of the gospel as we continue. The people of Israel forgot about God and began to worship the ark. They thought, hey, we can just bring this out and everything will be okay. And they learned the hard way that you can't ignore God in the midst of it. You continue reading in 1 Samuel 4, we realize that the Philistines have captured the ark and the Israelites are retreating. And a Benjaminite runs back to uh, Eli, the high priest, and he says, Eli, the ark has been captured. Your sons have been killed. And Eli falls backward in his chair. He dies immediately. His daughter-in-law gives birth, and in the midst of giving birth, she dies. And they name their son Ichabod. Ichabod. The glory has departed. God's presence has left. Can you imagine walking around with that name? What's your name? Ichabod. What's that mean? Worthless. Useless. God's presence has left. And yet that's what this young boy was called, Ichabod. And when we get to chapter 5, we're going to see something very interesting there. The Philistines took the ark and, and with all of its remaining loot, and they took it back to their city, and they placed it next to their god. They leave, and in the morning they come back, and their god is bowing down before the Ark of the Covenant. So they put it back up and they go back and the next day the Ark, their God has fallen and is broken into pieces and the Philistines realize there's something powerful here. And they get the message, they build the Ark, they put the Ark on it and get it out of there as quickly as possible. They say there's a curse among us. And they get the Ark and they bring it back to another city and then when they get to that city, everyone in that city gets, gets sick. And say so they move it to another city, and everyone in that city gets sick. And they go through five different cities, and everywhere the ark went, people in that city got sick. And finally, after seven months of sickness is going through their nation, the Philistines said, enough is enough. And they put the ark back on a calf, and they let the calf go, and the calf went straight back to the nation of Israel. They went directly to where God wanted them to go. See, so what we see here is a second stone. We see that in chapter 5, verse 14, the ark came to the field, I'm sorry, chapter 6, verse 14, in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stopped there. And a great stone was there. And they split the wood of the ark and offered the cows as a burnt offering. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the box that was beside it. And in it were golden figures and set them upon the great stone. So the people dismantled the ark they built the altar. They put the golden images up on the stone. And they said, God has returned to the people. And when the cart reaches the field, the people began to embrace it and began to embrace into altar worship. They took the cows and they sacrificed the cows on the altar. And they gave thanks because the ark has returned. The rock has reminded them that God has returned to their people. But it also testifies to another testimony. It was a witness of God's people turning to other things. The scripture says that as soon as they were done their celebrations, the people went back to their normal living and back to the idols that were in their home. They had performed their ritualistic acts. They had expressed their religion, but God, though he had returned, made no difference in their life. The Bible tells us that they returned to their idols and they lived that way for 20 years. God wasn't important to them. Stone number two teaches us that unless our hearts are fully engaged with God, our worship means nothing to God, it matters nothing to us, and it will make no difference in our world. Our hearts must be in tune with God. The Philistines saw from afar what God was doing. They saw that God was working in the Israelites, but they knew nothing of that God because the Israelites, their heart weren't filled with God. When we worship God heartless, when it's just a ritual for us, when it's just a thing that we do with our life, something that we just kind of add on to our schedules, when our heart is not engaged in listening to the voice of God and receiving it and believing it and trusting it, when our spirits are not in tune with the Spirit of God, not only does it mean nothing to God, it's actually offensive to Him. 
and I would argue that it would leave us empty and void and drained. It's a burden to mess with God if he is not filling our hearts on a daily basis. It's condemning to our spirits. We try to serve God, worship him, but we are left weary, lonely, sad, disillusioned, so we retreat to our idols that we harbor in our homes. Lost City, can I encourage you, may we never, ever play church. May we never just come here because this is the right thing to do or this is all we have left to do on a Sunday morning. May we not, be, may we not celebrate and be satisfied with what we can do May Jesus always capture our hearts. May our hearts burn in worship for him, whether that's when we gather here or at men's Bible study or at community groups or in our family worships or in our jobs. May our hearts burn for Jesus. May it be all about him in all that we do. May we never take him for granted. May we never say we just check off a few things that we do and be content. May our heart's desire be, God, I want to do what you're calling me to do. I want to live my life for you. I want to follow you to the ends of the earth. Whatever you're calling me to do, God, let me do it for you. Let our hearts burn for Jesus. I remember the night 12 years ago, we were sitting in an apartment in Plano, it was just me and my wife, and I took my computer out, and I just started writing about, God, what are you calling me to do here in Dallas? Why would you bring me to Dallas? It wasn't an easy thing for me to be in Dallas. Let me promise you that. And I started writing a vision that God started laying in my heart of raising a generation that was passionate about studying God's Word. And all I wanted to do was a Bible study, a Bible study that would begin to multiply and grow and we would see people passionate about studying God's word and falling in love with Jesus. It took two years for that to happen. I remember the first barbecue thing we did at our house, in our house in Rowlett, and wondering, is there anyone going to show up? Will anyone even come? Fortunately, there was three, four guys that just said, hey, I'm going to come and study God's word. I remember the first day of the Bible study of my house, wondering, God, what are you calling us to do? I remember people who I loved and respected discouraging their kids from coming to the Bible study because this wasn't a church thing. This was a totally separate thing. Wondering, sitting wondering if I was crazy for daydreaming, thinking that God could use me for his glory. I remember our first Sunday night service, just a few storefronts down. In the midst of major opposition in this city, incredible vicious attacks on my life and the life of Loft, wondering, God, if you're going to make this happen, if you're going to work. I remember in 2010 sitting with leadership and hearing from them that it's time to switch from a Bible study to a church, that it's time to get our own place, and internally saying, no, we don't. We don't need to switch to a church. Bible study is a headache enough. Now you want us to be a church? That's nuts. I remember as we struggled to get this property and hearing how people were excited about us getting our own property, wondering how in the world, how in the world are we going to get the finances to fund this? Crazy for doing this. I remember vividly the night before we started five years ago. I came here at like four in the morning because I couldn't sleep. And I sat here just saying, God, I still have time to back off. I can jump in my car and drive away and they will show up and they just won't find me. I'll be okay. Wondering if this is what God was calling me to do. I remember those weeks leading up to starting, wondering, God, is this what you're calling us to do? I remember the week leading up to our first service. Everything in this room came up in literally a week. The walls came up, the carpets came up. I'd come here every day at lunch and watch as they built the stage and as they built the walls, as they built the media center and the audio center and put the carpets down. I sat there and I watched these sheet rocks came up in less than seven days. Friends, these rocks in this room testify to our works. They do and they will. What they will say will be determined 
by whether we proclaim and trust Jesus in what he is doing in our city. If we as a church trust that this building and filling it each week is our work and that's it, we'll fail. What am I telling you? Well, city, put away your idols that disconnect you, your heart from God. May we as a church never just simply go through the motions, the rituals of false worship that we come to trust more than real worship. In the next five years, my prayer is that people would come because we brought them, because we did barbecues at the apartment communities and we just loved them, because we took their kids from the apartment communities and we brought them here and we mentored them and we loved them, because we loved them when they were hurting and when they were hurting, we hurt with them. Let them come because in the spirit of hospitality that distinguishes the heart of the gospel at Lost City, that spirit that welcomes and loves the least of these, let them come and know that we love them and Jesus loves them and God has a great plan and purpose for their life. May they come because we're intentional of living our lives for Jesus in our workplaces, in our families, and wherever God's called us to do. May we live our lives in such a way that people are drawn to the Savior that lives inside of us, and may they come because they see that Christ has changed our lives. May our hearts never get cold in worship. May we be passionate about Jesus every day of our lives. Stone number three, First Samuel 7 verse 3, 20 years later, the people lamented before God, but they did nothing to turn their hearts and continued to worship the idols of their lives. And now Samuel comes and he speaks and he leads the people. He preaches the gospel. Thank goodness that God opens our ears to hear that message. The people hear the message. They believe it. They obey. And what a great day in Israel. When the ark returns the people who were trusting in, through, um, in it through the work that they had done. They thought the ark was the point. They thought the ark was the mission. You know, sometimes if you've been around church very long, sometimes when people start a church, people make a terrible mistake to believe that the work of the mission is done. I am so thankful for this facility that God's blessed us with. I'm so thankful that we as a church never got caught up in thinking that we're good and we're content. That we have always loved. That we have given and given and given. Do you know our annual budget is somewhere between 100 and 120,000 a year? But in the last five years, we've given over $200,000 to outreach and missions to loving our city and reaching our city. You know what that tells me? We love Jesus. We love our community. May we never lose sight of that. May we be passionate that until every person in this city hears, whether they accept it or not, that's on God. But it's our job to let them know there's a God that loves them, that cares for them, that died for them. May we never lose sight of that. May we continue to do that every single time we meet. May we be reminded of that. Still number three teaches us that our proper response and responsibility unto God is to return to him, to confess our sins, to destroy our idols, to engage our hearts with Jesus, to restore true worship and to experience his work among us. This is our remembrance. When we enter each week, it should remind us, it should shape our story we're here because Jesus loved us, and because he's loved us, we're called to love those around us. Let me conclude this way. Scripture says a rock will testify to God. If a rock can represent the help of God in our lives, that's all it does. It represents God's help in our lives. How much more the work of God's people, you and I, when our hearts are engaged in the work of the gospel? How much more when the labor of our hands in which we cultivate the gospel represent God's work among us more than a rock? Lost City, may we give ourselves to the greatness of the glory of God by engaging our hearts with the one who gave us his life. 
by put, giving our hands into the work that he has called us to do, by welcoming the one who he shall bring for our inheritance. Until our hearts are right, no stone we raise, no memorial we celebrate, nothing we remember will matter. May our stone of help never be worshipped instead of the helper himself, but always remind ourselves that what God has done and what he is preparing to do in and through us. This morning we celebrate. He is our Ebenezer. He has been our help. He has been our source, our strength. And to him we give all glory, all honor, all worship. Every city here at Loft City, we celebrate communion. We do that intentionally because every week we are reminded that this is not about us, it's about Jesus. Because I have this danger of thinking that I did this. I worked so hard at this. And every week the communion table reminds me now, Jesus did this. This is his doing. This is his work. I just get to celebrate and be a part of it. So we're going to celebrate communion. And normally we have you guys come up and grab the elements, but we're going to pass them out this week. And so they're going to, when you get them, whenever you're ready, you can grab them. And you, whenever you are ready to take them, you can take the elements this morning. Um, we'll continue in worship this morning. But let me pray, and we'll partake of the communion this morning. Our Father, we thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you that you are absolutely good to us. As we come to the table this morning, we recognize that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, that he took our place so that we can become sons and daughters of God. So we thank you for that work. May Jesus be honored and glorified.